open up our Bibles. We have got a long way to go here tonight, and there's some good stuff in this third chapter of Zephaniah. So turn with me in your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 3. We're going to finish off this incredible uh, set of prophecies that I think you, uh, I hope you've enjoyed them as much as I have. And this third chapter is just an incredible set of, I mean, there's some truths in here that are just, just excite me and just, uh, I hope that they will excite and awaken your heart as well. So these prophecies that we've been studying by Zephaniah are prophecies that were given just shortly before, just a few short years before the return of the Babylonians to completely destroy the city of Jerusalem. And so we're, these prophecies covered that immediate uh, destruction. But in our third chapter here tonight, we're going to look at his, the ultimate destruction of the world and the prophecies that concern that judgment that is still yet to come. And then also God's regatherance of his people back into their land. And so that's what this chapter is all about. So let's just begin. Verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, Woe to you, to her who is rebellious and polluted, to the oppressing city. She has not obeyed his voice. She has not received correction. She has not trusted in the Lord. She has not drawn near to her God. Her princes in the midst of her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till the morning. Her prophets are insolent, treacherous people. Her priests have polluted the sanctuary. They have done violence to the law. So here is this indictment of the city of Jerusalem. Now the city of Jerusalem is not specifically named here in this particular text, but clearly from the latter part of verse 4, it says her priests have polluted the sanctuary. And so it can only refer to the city where the sanctuary abides, which is the city of Jerusalem. And so he, God charges the people here and the civil and religious leaders of this particular city. And he tells them destruction is coming. Now notice what he says here in verse 2, which I think is quite essential uh, for every one of us here today, because this is what his indictment of these people were. They did not obey his voice. They did not receive his correction. They didn't trust in him, nor did they draw near to him. Now those four things are literally, they are, they're one upon another. One issue upon another issue. They, they are all are really a necessity beginning with the first one. This first indictment here, he says, they did not obey his voice. She has not obeyed his voice. Now this is a primary issue. Now hearing the voice of the Lord and obeying the voice of the Lord are two totally different things. You can hear the voice of God, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to obey it. I mean, how many times have we heard the Lord say, don't say that, and yet you go right ahead and say it. Don't go there, and you go there anyway. And you pay the price every single time. We hear his voice, but we don't obey his voice. Now, if you don't hear his voice, then you're obviously not going to receive correction because that's how you receive correction is you hear his voice. You hear what he says to you. And he says, don't do that. Don't go there. Don't play with that. It'll it'll destroy you. And then if you don't receive his correction, why is that? Because you don't trust in him. You don't trust that what he's telling you is the truth and it is the best for your life. And that's why you don't respond and receive 
the correction. And if you don't trust in him, you're never going to draw near to him. So each one of these issues are essential. They're essential for the growth in your relationship. They're essential for you to draw near to the Lord. And that is where life is to be found. So the same problems that they experienced are the same problems that we experience today. The same struggles they had are the same struggles that we have. And so these are essential to understand. So at the beginning of this whole thing, before you can obey his voice, you have to hear his voice. So how are you doing with that? When, when you hear his voice, do you acknowledge that? Lord, I hear you. I say that many times to the Lord. I, I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking about some situation and I just sense the Lord speaking to me and I just, I just usually say it out loud. Lord, I hear you. I got it. I, I, I know what you're telling me to do. And then my responsibility is to do it. So that, that is the key. So how do you hear his voice? Why should you hear his voice? All of these questions are essential to answer. Now on our website on, at calvaryag.org, we, if you look under Bible studies, there's a little study there that we've done on how to hear the voice of the Lord. So if you want to do an in-depth study on this subject, that is where I would encourage you to go. And let me just give you a brief rundown on this. What keeps you from hardening your heart to God. What is the primary thing the Bible says keeps you from hardening your heart to God? It's hearing His voice. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 through 9, there the apostle says, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you will hear His voice, do not harden your hearts, as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works 40 years. So in other words, don't test God, don't try Him, because He's going to correct you. If you reject and harden your heart, He is going to correct you. And that's what He did with the children of Israel. But He says, today, if you will hear His voice. The word today shows you there's an urgency. Don't, don't say, oh, manana. Tomorrow I'll hear his voice. No, today I will hear his voice. I will do what he tells me to do today because it is that essential. So how do you hear his voice? Well, there's so many ways that God has and, and will speak to you. He can use an audible voice as he did with people in the scripture. That is not the normal way that God speaks to his people. But he can speak in that manner. Or he can use prophet as he did in the Old Testament. Or as he did in the New Testament in the book of Acts. Uh, the prophet Agabus spoke the word of God. He warned Paul not to go to Jerusalem. And he said, the man that owns this, this girdle, he said, he wrapped it up, he said, so he will be bound when he, when, when he goes there. So, there are Old Testament prophets. There are New Testament prophets. But God also speaks through his word. What you have right now in your lap. This is one of the primary ways that God speaks to us. In Psalm 103 verse 20, it says this. Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding the voice of his word. Notice, heeding the voice of his word. If you want to hear the voice of the spirit, just open your Bible. And, and then notice, he doesn't say just they hear his word. They heed his word. You have to heed it. Obey it. And so a very important way that God speaks to us. He gives you the voice of conscience. Another very important way that God speaks to us. He's given to every single man on this earth, every woman on this earth. He's given them that voice of conscience. And if a person rejects the voice of conscience, then 
They're basically hardening their heart. Paul said those that, in, that he was ministering to, some had hardened their heart, they had rejected their conscience, and he said they made shipwreck in their life. And so, a very serious issue. In Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 5, there Nehemiah was concerned about how he was going to handle rebuilding the temple and the city of Jerusalem. And it says, Then my God put it into my heart to gather the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be registered. So he gave him just a very simple first step of how he was going to proceed. But notice, he says, God put it in my heart. And God will put thoughts into your heart. And your heart is synonymous with your mind. So he will put thoughts into your mind. And that is how the Holy Spirit will speak to you as well. In the New Testament, in Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 30. Notice there, this is where God directs Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch who is in the desert. And he wants to reach this Ethiopian because he wants to send the gospel to Ethiopia as this man is heading back to his land, his homeland. And so it says, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip saying, arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge over all her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning. And sitting in his chariot, he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, notice that. Now I wonder, how did the Spirit say to Philip? It was most likely just, again, like Nehemiah. God just put it into his mind. A simple thought that comes into his mind. He says, go near and overtake the chariot. So Philip ran to him. And heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And the man said, no. And Philip ended up leading this man to Christ. And so this is how the Lord wants you to hear his voice. He's given you many different means and he uses those means as he so chooses. But the primary one is his word. If you want to sensitize your ear to the voice of the Spirit, and to what the Spirit is saying, you have to know the Scriptures. The better you know the Scriptures, when that thought comes into your mind, instantly you go, that is in harmony with God's Word, that is a correct thing, that's what I'm going to do. And so, it is essential that you sensitize yourself to that issue. And so, to draw near to Him is the ultimate The ultimate end. Notice, each one of these items, you have to hear His voice, you have to receive His correction, because you trust in Him, and that's what's going to draw you near to Him. Now, people can draw near externally to God. Jesus said this in Matthew 15, 8. He said, these people draw near to me with their mouth. And honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. And so their hearts are way apart from me. Not near to me at all. So my heart has to be in the right place for me to hear him. To draw near to him. And he, he draws me unto himself. And so it's an essential thing that you allow him to do that. Now notice he rebukes here in verses 3 and 4 the prince's the judges, the prophets, and the priests. Now here you have civil leaders, civil government leaders, and you have religious leaders. Now, civil government leaders and religious leaders in our country are of utmost importance to our land. Why? Because they direct what's going on in our country. So who you vote for in every election 
is really a major responsibility. And I encourage you, if you're not someone who does their homework to find out where people stand, what, where their beliefs are, you need to do that. Because the scripture tells us in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, it says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people, a dis- the destruction of any people. And that is what is happening in our country today. Our country is slowly being destroyed. I know Ravi Zacharias, I was listening to him just today, and he said, I don't know whether we are at a point of no return. That's what he said. He said, I'm not sure whether we've passed that, that place of no return. And I thought to myself, how sad that would be. Now, God can bring an awakening, yes. But I'm telling you, people have to respond when that awakening occurs. And if people are shameless in their, their rejection of God, then I guarantee you that it won't be received. So, again, Zephaniah is writing at the end of Josiah's reign. Josiah was a you know, a, a guy who restored the nation Israel back to where it should have been. But it didn't last because the heart of the people were not there. They, they, were, not, they were not with, their hearts were not with the Lord. And so the religious leaders, again, are just as important. I guarantee you the religious leaders have so much responsibility today with where our nation is at. And one day they're going to have to stand before God and to give account for the baloney that came across from their pulpits. And I'm telling you, I don't want to be in their shoes. I'm going to teach the Word of God and I'm going to proclaim that no matter if nobody comes here to church. So I'm going to proclaim that if I was not even a pastor. That's what I'm going to do. Because that's my only responsibility. Is to speak the truth in love and let people make their decision, their choice. Remember, righteousness exalts a nation. Righteousness is not where we're at today. That's for sure. Not when we, we kill a million and a half children in abortion every single year. And not when we uh, thumb our nose at God and reject Him. That's we're not in a in a place where we should be. Now notice how Zephaniah responds to this incredible corruption in the city of Jerusalem. Verse five, he says, "The Lord is righteous in her midst; He will do no unrighteousness." Every morning he brings his justice to light. He never fails. But the unjust knows no shame. I have cut off nations. Their fortresses are devastated. I have made their streets desolate. With none passing by, These, their cities are destroyed. There is no one, no inhabitant. I said, surely you will fear me. You will receive instruction so that her dwelling would not be cut off, despite everything for which I punished her, but they arose early and corrupted all their deeds. In other words, no matter what correction or judgment he brought upon them, they still turned. They still continued to sin. In the book of Revelation, it tells us that the people, after the judgments of God come upon this, this world, that people will shake their fist and blaspheme God. And all you can say is judgment is just for people who do that. And that's what he's saying here. This judgment is coming. He says, I was hoping, I was wishing that surely you would fear me. You will receive instruction. This is why God's judgments are always in incremental uh, increases. He doesn't, he doesn't just 
waste everybody all of a sudden. He simply does it in increments. And it gets worse and worse until we will hear. Until we will respond, hopefully. And so notice he declares here in verse 5. Verse 5 is is so full. I mean, we could just do the whole study here on verse 5 tonight. He says, the Lord is righteous. Even though man and the judges and the priests and the prophets are unrighteous, they're, I mean, he calls them in verses 3 and 4 just wild animals, roaring lions, evening wolves. They're insolent, they're treacherous, they're, they, they polluted and twisted the, the law of God. He's saying, but I am righteous. God says, I am unright- I'm righteous and I will do no unrighteousness. What an incredible blessing to know that. He is so completely holy and righteous, he can do no unrighteousness. Now, do you believe that? If you believe that, then you will trust him even when things are tough in your own life. But if you don't believe that and things get tough, you'll say, well, I don't know, where is God? Where is he? And that is your, that is your test, I guarantee you. So this better be clearly set in your heart. Notice it says there, every morning he brings his justice to light. Wow. Every morning he brings his justice to light. Now the image here is that justice always took place in the gate of the city in the morning. Because Israel is, except for a few months during the wintertime, is extremely hot. It's very warm there. And so they did all their business in the morning. And so the Lord always speaks about this, bringing forth his justice in the morning. Or as the, the morning dew, his, his truth and his, his light comes forth. And so it's, it's just kind of an image that helps you to, to see what he's declaring here. But it's... How does his word come forth every day? How does his truth and justice come to light? Well, it comes to light simply by the way that he deals with mankind. In other words, you should, in your own life, you will see God's blessings upon those who believe and trust in him every day. And you will see God's correction and him dealing with people who rebel against him. We see it all the time. And you see it in your life. When people do not follow him, it's just one turmoil after another, after another. And, and sometimes people just go, I don't know what's the matter with my life. Something's the matter. But those of you that have come to Christ, you've come to that conclusion that that is what drew you to him, is it not? That's what happened to me. I came to the conclusion, there is so much messed up in my life. Something is wrong. What is it? And then someone shared the gospel with me. And I went, the light came on. And I went, well, of course. If I'm rebelling against God, obviously I can't think that God is going to bless my life. That's not going to happen. And so God is, he brings forth his justice to light. And then you notice he says, he never fails. And I like that. Oh, that's, that's the title of this particular study. He never fails. So, how does he never fail? That's the question. How does he never fail? Well, he never fails to bring judgment where judgment and justice is due. Because his justice comes forth every morning. And he never fails to bless those that follow him and believe in him. That's where he never fails. He never fails. He will always fulfill his word. Because his word never fails. Because his compassions fail not. Notice that in Lamentations Chapter 3, verse 22 and 23. There, Jeremiah said, 
through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Why? Because His compassions fail not. They are new when? Every morning. Great is your faithfulness. So He's faithful to bring forth His mercy every morning to someone who will respond to it. He is also faithful to bring forth His correction where it is needed. But notice he says here, it is through his mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. So God is a, a God who he keeps his word. He keeps his word every single day and he will fulfill it. Let me give you two examples of him keeping his word in judgment and one in blessing. In Ezekiel 24 verse 14, There Ezekiel is declaring the word of the Lord. He says, I the Lord have spoken it. It shall come to pass and I will do it. I will not hold back, nor will I spare, nor will I relent. According to your ways and according to your deeds, they will judge you, says the Lord God. So he says, I said it. What did he say? He says, I'm going to judge you. I'm going to deal with you. And Ezekiel is reminding the people, this is why you are in Babylon. This is why you've been taken captive. Because God said it was going to come to pass. And it did. Because remember, Ezekiel was the, one of the prophets of God taken with the children of Israel into Babylon. And so he's speaking after the fact. Then Ezekiel does the same thing referring to God's blessings in the future. In Ezekiel 36, verse 36, he says, Then the nations which are left all around, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt rebuilt the ruined places and planted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it, and I will do it, because he will not fail to fulfill his word. And so if you're banking on the fact that, well, maybe this won't happen. Maybe the book of Revelation won't take place. Maybe the judgment isn't really real. Don't, I wouldn't bet on that. I I would not take bets on that. Okay? It would be a losing bet. So don't you. I encourage you to hear his voice. But notice at the end of verse 5, he says, but the unjust knows no shame. The unjust knows no shame. In other words, he's just saying, you know what? They could care less. No matter how righteous I am, how unfailing my word is, my compassions toward them are, they know no shame. They're just going to continue. And they're going to rebel. And so that's what he declares. Verse 8, now he declares the judgment of the whole earth. Now, he declares here in verse 8, Therefore wait for me, says the Lord, until the day I rise up from, for plunder, my determination is to gather the nations. Notice, not just the nation of Babylon, but nations, plural. And he says, to my assembly of kingdoms, again, plural, not just one kingdom, He says, to pour on them my indignation, all my fierce anger, all the earth shall be devoured. So he's not talking about just the nation of Israel, not just the nation of Babylon, not just any individual nation. He's talking about the whole earth will one day be devoured. He said, with the fire of my jealousy. And so God now turns to just speak about this final destruction, which will be the the ultimate battle of Armageddon that takes place and is referred to in Revelation chapter 19. If you want to read that, you can read what incredible devastation will be brought upon this this world. But notice he says here in verse, at the beginning of verse 8, wait for me, says the Lord. Why is he saying, wait for me? Well, it's because of what he's just said, who he is. He is the Lord who is righteous. 
He is the one who will not fail. He is the one who will fulfill his, his righteousness in the earth. So he's saying, wait for me. Now this is important because you have to wait for him to fulfill his word. It doesn't always happen in your timing, right? You have to wait for him. And I believe that that is what the apostles taught over and over again. In James 5, 7, he says, Therefore, be patient, brother, until the coming of the Lord. Philippians 3, 20. He says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So, throughout the New Testament, we are encouraged to wait. Don't give up. Don't you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So that is, that is what God encourages us as believers to do. So you need to wait for him and allow him to fulfill his purpose in his own time. Now, in verses 19, 9 through 20, he gives all the promises of restoration. So we'll end with this. Verse 9, notice he begins, for then I will restore to the peoples. Now, then, when is then? Well, after the judgment of the earth. After the tribulation period and the second coming occurs, this is when this will take place. It's then. For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language that they may all call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one accord. So what does he declare here? This first thing he declares is that he is going to reverse the judgment of the tongues in Genesis chapter 11. Remember there, God confused the, the one language of the people so that they could not communicate with each other anymore because he didn't want them being unified to fulfill their evil intent. So that's why we have so many languages today, is so that there is some kind of a separation and a barrier because together, sinful men will do incredible evil. And so at, when he comes to reign on this earth, He's going to give everybody, it says, a pure language. What language will that be? Most likely it'll be the, the language of Hebrew. And we will all learn one language. We will all be able to speak one language. But that's my guess. Scripture doesn't say that. It's just my guess. And then he says, verse 10. From beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, my worshipers and the daughters of my dispersed ones shall bring my offering. And in that day, you shall not be ashamed for any of your deeds in which you transgressed against me. For then I will take away from your midst those who rejoice in your pride. And you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. And so, he declares in verse 10 that the worshipers, all the earth, from the furthest reaches of the earth. Now, for the people of Israel, Ethiopia was as far as they could think. I mean, Ethiopia was, was a month's travel away. So, beyond the rivers, beyond the people of Ethiopia, he says, they're all going to come. The world is going to come to worship him. And he tells them in verse 11 that they are not going to be ashamed anymore for their deeds. Why? Because he's going to forgive them. That's why. He's going to forgive men's sins. And anybody that makes it through the tribulation period and comes to worship him, is are, are, well, God is going to give them a, a new start, a new earth. And they are going to be forgiven of their sin. In verse 12, he said, I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people, and, and they shall trust in the name of the Lord. Now notice, this is directly contrary 
to what he declared in verse 2. That the people of Jerusalem did not trust in him. They were prideful. They, were, they rejected him. And he tells them, just the opposite is going to take place. I'm going to leave in your midst a meek and humble people that trust in the name of the Lord. So the, the nation of Israel is going, to, is going to have a complete restoration. They have not ever had this take place in all their history. This is only something that is going to take place still, yet future. And so he says, I'm going to cleanse you, I'm going to restore you, and I'm going to bring back humble, meek, trusting people. They're the ones that are going to do righteousness. In other words, the meek will inherit the earth. Now, where did you hear that? Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So, just what Jesus declared now will come to pass in the midst of Israel. And he says, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness and speak no lies, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouth, for they shall feed their flocks and lie down, and no one shall make them afraid. So he describes here in verse 13 this this incredible uh, blessing that is going to come upon the nation of Israel. They're not going to fear war. They're not going to fear evil anymore. Why? Because the scripture says in the book of Revelation chapter 19 that Jesus is going to reign here on the earth with a rod of iron. In other words, anybody plays a game with him, they're going to be dealt with. It's, it's, it's not going to be, oh, I wonder... Is that right or wrong? No. He knows the heart. He will deal with each and every one according to their need. And so the Jews are going to then, verse 14, they're going to rejoice. He says, Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. And you shall see disaster no more. Now there is a, there's a time reference right there at the end of verse 15. You shall see disaster no more. That's one time in history. It's the millennial reign of Christ. When Christ sets up his kingdom here upon the earth. That is the only time that particular verse can be fulfilled. So, you know he is clearly talking here about the, the end of times issues. So notice what he says in verse 14. He says, be glad and rejoice. Why? Because in verse 15 he says, the king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. That's why they're going to rejoice. I'd re- I'm going to rejoice in that too. You're going to rejoice in that. When he reigns upon the earth. Because man is incapable of governing himself. He is incapable. I don't care how good a form of government you have. It will be corrupted every single time. Because corrupt men are running the show. And when you have an uncorrupted individual reigning over the earth then you will have true righteousness. So don't put your hope in a government. Don't put your hope in anybody. Put your hope in the Lord. But then, notice in verse 16, he says, In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Let not your hands be weak. The Lord your God in your midst, the Mighty One, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Now, I love this. I mean, I'm telling you. uh, Verse 16, he says, don't fear. And why should they not fear? He says it again in verse 17. The Lord your God in your midst, he will save. He is the one who will take care of you. He's the one that's going to reign over this earth in true righteousness. 
And so he said, he's telling them, rejoice. But verse 17 changes the message just a little bit. Notice, who is doing the rejoicing now? It says, the Lord will rejoice over you. Isn't that cool? He's, he's telling them back in verse 14, they are going to rejoice over the Lord. But now in verse 17, he says, the Lord is going to rejoice over you. Isn't that interesting? He will rejoice over you with gladness. You see, does God love you? Absolutely. Does he want the best for you? Absolutely. Does he want to bestow upon you his gifts and his grace? Does does he want to do that? Yes. And here, he's going to rejoice. Now he can do it. And it's going to be unhindered. Because the kingdom age will be what he has always wanted to do for the entire earth. And it says here, he will quiet you with his love. Literally, this means to silence you or to make you still or to make you at peace. So in other words, when he rejoices over you, you know what it's going to do? You're just going to be sitting there and just go, wow. You're going to be speechless. It, it, another way that this can be translated in the Hebrew is to make you dumb. You can't speak. You just be silent. Now, have you ever got to that place where the Holy Spirit overflows you and touches you and so ministers to you that you, you can't even talk? You know, you just, you just sit there and you just go, wow, this is just too cool. This is so great. And then he says, and he will rejoice over you with singing. Now, the word rejoice there means to shout for joy or to shriek ecstatically. Now, in Israel today, the, when the women go to the Western Wall, they shriek ecstatically. And any of you who have been to Israel with us, you've sat there and you've heard them. They, they let these shrieks out. And it's just they're rejoicing that they're their sons are, you know, having their bar mitzvah and they're becoming men. They're reading the scripture for themselves. And it, it's just a, and so the Lord says, this is what I'm going to do over you. He's going to shriek ecstatically. Wow. That's, in, that's pretty cool. He says, I will gather those who sorrow, verse 18, over the appointed assembly. Who are, who are among you? To whom is reproach is a burden. Behold, at that time I will deal with all who afflict you and I will save the lame and gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land where they will be put to shame. So he basically declares here, look, uh, anybody that's afflicted you, O Israel, I am going to take care of them. Now, do you remember any place in the New Testament where Jesus said, inasmuch as you've done it unto the least of one of these, you've done it to me. So, in the Old Testament, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, the Lord said there, I will bless those that bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in, all, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. And we're experiencing that blessing right now. But one day, he will deal with those that have cursed Israel. And then he says in verse 20, At that time, I will bring you back. Even at the time I gather you, I will give you fame and praise among all the peoples of the earth. When I return your captives before your eyes, says the Lord. Now only during the millennial period when Christ reigns on this earth will this particular verse of scripture be fully fulfilled. Yes, the Jews are returning in droves to the nation Israel now. But that's nothing compared to what will take place after the second coming. They will all return. Now let me just leave you with this one thought. 
after reading this chapter and seeing what God has said about the nation Israel, please do not let any teacher or preacher ever tell you that God is done with the nation Israel. That the nation Israel is no more. And we now, the church, are the, the, the true Israel of God. When you hear that, I can guarantee you, just you know the, this individual does not know his Bible. Okay? That's the bottom line. He has not studied his Bible. Because this third chapter makes it pretty clear. The teaching that I'm referring to is called reform theology or replacement theology. It's replacing Israel with the church. And most reform theologians believe in replacement theology. So be careful when you hear that. Let me read these last few verses to you so that you can see even from the New Testament, Paul said the very same thing. Romans 11, verse 25. He says, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. Now, this is after he's talked for three chapters, chapter 9, 10, and 11 in Romans, about God's plan for Israel. He says, I don't want you to be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel, until... Notice that word, underline it, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. In other words, until the last Gentile comes into the church that God has ordained, he's going to be working with us Gentiles. And when that takes place, then he is going to turn his attention back to the nation Israel. And he's going to fulfill the 70th week of Daniel where he fulfills his promise to judge the world and to correct the nation of Israel and then ultimately come again. And for a thousand years, he's going to fulfill all of the promises that he has made in the Old Testament towards the nation Israel that are unfulfilled. Now, if a promise goes unfulfilled, then God lied, right? So a promise that's unfulfilled, that you've never seen take place, and there are many of them, if you doubt that, come, I'll show you quite a few of them just tonight. And he has to fulfill them. And that's what's going to take place during the millennial reign of Christ. In Romans 11, 12, it says this, referring to the Jews, Now, if their fall is the riches of the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? They will experience this fullness that we have just read tonight. Romans 11, 15, referring to the Jews. For if their being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead. And that's exactly what's going to take place. Life from the dead. He's going to take the dry bones of Ezekiel 37 and he is going to bring life to those dry bones again. And the nation will rise again. And that's what you're seeing in front of you. That's why you should be assured his coming is near even at the doors, because God's people are back in their land. So, it's soon. Are you ready? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that, Lord, you are fulfilling your word, every single dot and tittle, and every word that you have spoken, you will fulfill. You never fail. Your word never fails. Your promises never fail. And your judgments never fail. And so, Lord, we trust in that fact. And, Lord, I pray you just put an excitement in our hearts 
And I pray that you'd put a zeal in our souls that we would communicate your, your truth and your love to, your, to the people that are lost in this world, lost in our community, lost in our families. Lord, we pray that you'd give us your holy anointing. Fall upon us tonight by your Holy Spirit and en enable us to be your light and your soul in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.